Hi and welcome to another edition of Get The Life You Love Now. I'm Phil Parker, your host, and today I've got Mark Williamson, who is the awesome director of Action For Happiness, and I'm going to be asking him a whole bunch of questions about how he did that, what inspires him. So listen in, I hope you enjoy meeting Mark Williamson. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Phil. Nice thanks, to be here. Thanks for being here. So uh, where, where are we going to begin? It's a question I, I, I often ask, which is, tell us something about you that other people may not know. Well, I think it depends on which people we're, we're talking about here because many of the people who know me well in connection with my work now with Action for Happiness probably may not know that you know, maybe back 10, 15, 20 years ago I was uh, a sort of researcher working in telecommunications, very sort of technically led and technology focused, and also that I spent a lot of time working in the commercial world, advising companies, working for financial services, a lot of stuff that seems a million miles away from what I do now. Um, but I guess maybe for people who knew me back in, in those days, they would be surprised and still remain surprised by this transition that's happened in my life and the fact that I now do things like run a, a small charity focused on happiness and well-being and you know, I sing in a local community choir. I do lots of um, very, you might say, down-to-earth things that fill me with a lot of happiness and perhaps are a, a long way away from that commercial and sort of research-led background. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, Action for Happiness, I know you through mm. Action for Happiness, but... People watching, there may be a few people who've lived in a cave for you who haven't heard about Action for Happiness. Mm. Uh, tricky question, I know, but if you can sum it up in a few sentences, what's it all about? Well, we're building a movement of people that have a shared conviction that happiness matters. And it matters to us as individuals. We all want to live happy lives. We want our, our loved ones and our you know, people we care about to, to be happy. But it also matters for our society. It matters in terms of the priorities we would like our politicians to have. You know, they should be promoting well-being, not just good in the economy. It matters in our workplaces. The key to productivity is you know, feeling good and feeling that you function well and are connected. It matters in our homes, in our families, in our schools, in our communities. So however you look at it, happiness and well-being matter deeply to each of us and to, and to our nation, our society, and yet we don't give them enough attention. We're focused on economic metrics of success. We're focused on attaining and accumulating and owning and having and succeeding, but we sort of lose sight of what really matters. Mm. Well, I talk a lot about happiness in my work, mm. and, and one of my favourite stats is that there's some st study by Dinah Chan in 2011 where they compared people's happiness and health, and what he found was if you're happy, you get an average of 10 minutes extra health, mm, that's right. which is extraordinary, particularly when you compare it to smoking, which is one of the things the government has been uh, mm. for a long time. It's, the cost of smoking is about 10 years of your life as well, mm. and yet the government's agenda around health and smoking is quite clear, but around happiness is like... Mm, you know, get on with it. It's not that important. They don't really work towards it. So I think it's really interesting that you know the work you're doing is also looking at a governmental agenda because that's interesting. Although I do I do get a bit scared about what government happiness might look mm, like. That's interesting. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that's generated a, a challenging reaction to this whole agenda, for want of a better word, is that the fact that people have lost a huge amount of faith with our leaders and our politicians and you know, people quite quite rightly would say, well, we can't even trust these guys to manage the economy. How would they? Hang on. It's frightening to think that they might be in charge of our <laughs> happiness. And of course, no one's suggesting that government can or should make us happy. But what they can do is they can create the conditions for people to flourish in life. Yeah. You know, the, the, the transport infrastructure that we have you know, is an obvious way that they affect our well-being. But there are many, many actually far more fundamental ways, like the, the fundamental ethos of our education system. Is it all just about passing exams or is it about building skills for life? Uh, the way they approach healthcare. At the moment, we have a health system, which is basically an illness system and focus on physical health. And yet, but the biggest source of suffering in our society isn't physical illness, it isn't poverty, it isn't unemployment, all those things are all, all really matter. It's actually mental illness, you know, the, the stress, anxiety, depression that's so prevalent and so, again, little talked about. So again, government can and must do things to promote well-being, and that's part, a big part of what we do. But of course, we're very much about the personal dimension as well. It's, I think it's very interesting as well, because it brings up massive questions at the moment. You may know I'm doing a PhD, mm. particularly looking at addictions and looking at how people flourish, which for me is a solution for addiction, which sure. is difficult to flourish. But measuring happiness and measuring flourish, it's quite a tricky metric. You can do it, but it's mm. in, in terms of the scientific model of, you know, how many millimetres or something have we got in the test tube is such a different thing. And yet, it's so important because happiness is so important. And as humans, we don't work like metric machines. Mm. We work like emotive things that we are. So it's, it's, it's a real... It's fascinating, but it's, it's also more possible than people 
recognise. Because the fundamental way of ask, finding out about someone's happiness or as researchers would call it their subjective well-being is to ask them, you know, yes, how exactly. do you feel about your life? So yeah. a question like, overall, how happy with you are you with your life on a scale of 0 to 10? Whilst anyone's individual response can't be compared very clearly with someone else's individual response because we have unique personal interpretations of what those scales mean, actually on mass and in aggregate, those things are hugely meaningful. Everybody knows how to answer that question. Yeah. And if you compare it across time and across nations, you get incredibly meaningful and useful results. So we know that, for example, you know, the least happy countries are the sub-Saharan African countries, as you might expect. The countries that happiness has fallen most recently are countries like Egypt and Syria, where we all know what's going on. And the countries that do best are, are some of the northern European countries like Denmark and Norway, where they have high levels of trust, high levels of equality, very good you know, support for people across the whole of society. So th there's lots that you can do to measure happiness accurately. And when you do measure the, with those questions, and you then put people into something you know, that, that the scientific community would trust, like an MRI scanner, you find that their brain activity correlates with what they say. So there is an objective truth to these kind of subjective reports of how happy I feel. Yeah. So I think we're now getting from a, oh, we can't really comment on happiness, it's just the, the, the a domain for religion and philosophy, actually to say, no, no, there's an empirical science base behind this. Now. I, think that's, I think that's really good and interesting, actually. Uh, but it's also bizarre that we have to prove it in that way. Of course. You know, it's like, are you happy? Yeah, I am. Let me just check. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you said you're happy. It's the same with depression. The only way you can diagnose someone with depression is by asking them, what's your mood like? Mm -hmm. If they go, it's absolutely fine, then they're right. You can, needing sure. some external expert is, is kind of bizarre that we have to do it because we're still stuck in that system. Absolutely. And just back to the point about people worrying about government getting involved in this. I mean, the whole point of that, that point you just made is that our subjective personal experience really matters. People sometimes criticise this as, oh, it's a subjective topic. But actually, nothing could be more important than how you experience your own life. Instead of leaders saying, well, you must be doing well because you have this level of housing and income and all these things, actually nothing matters more than our own lived experience. And so asking people how they feel about their lives, nothing could be more important. Yeah, it, it's, it's absolutely the truth, isn't it? It's like so many people measure by the wrong statistics, like how much money do I mm. have, you know, how big is my car? And we know that that really doesn't work in the long term. It's like what really feeds your soul, what makes mm. you happy. It's, it, and it's individual for different people, and that's fine. But it's so important, it gets missed out. You were saying earlier about schooling, I spend a lot of my time talking about schooling, because I spend a lot of time te teaching people how to be happy, how to deal with stuff. And one of the things we often comment is, you know, you learn, you know, you can tell me what happened in 1066, and you can tell me what mm. the capital of Japan is, but nobody taught you how to be happy, or how to deal with this, the real stuff of life that, that is, again, going back to what you said, causing 90% of doctors' consultations, which is stress, you know, emotional relations, mm. and stuff. Well, just on that note, one of our founders of Action of Happiness is Richard Layard, who's come at this from the economic angle as an economist, and there's sort of challenge this notion of, you know, what's our priority as a society. Another of the founders, though, very much plays to what you've just said there. So Anthony Selden um, is, a, is the master of a school where he was one of the first people to introduce happiness onto the curriculum. So, uh, you know, it's an independent school. It's perhaps the luxury to do this in the way that some state schools haven't to date. But they, you know, they've seen a, a phenomenal improvement in outcomes, both sort of what you might call personal outcomes, but also academic outcomes, from saying our whole ethos as a school is about well-being. We teach kids life skills to not just pass exams, but to, to cope well when things go wrong, to be resilient, to communicate effectively, to be in touch with their feelings. And actually, you know, this, this is so important in our current education system that's got its priorities crazily wrong. We're, we're, we're creating schools that are exam factories, mm -hmm. and yet we know that the single biggest driver of success in life, however you define that, in terms of well-being, is actually the emotional health of the child. It's not their intellectual development, it's not even their behaviour, although that matters. It's their emotional health. And that comes, of course, from our families, and, um, but, but you know, schools and the wider system can play a role in helping people you know, just, just learn how to live well and cope well with what life throws at them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so you, yeah. here you are in your t-shirt with a broken, <laughs> broken skateboard. How did you get from being, you know, very much techie into doing this? Yeah, well, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> um, well, I mean, various, not wanting to tell the whole life story, um, but, but I mean, the various transitions along the way have all been meaningful. So the first was I was working in this research environment, uh, did a PhD in wireless telecoms for my sins, but um, realised that I wasn't cut out for that environment because I was a people person and was losing my connectedness to others, actually. This, the research community didn't really bring it out to me. So I grabbed hold of the idea of moving into management consulting, I liked problem solving, I had a sort of technology linked to it, but it was very people focused. So I went into that world and 
Loved it in many ways, huge challenge and a great responsibility, but actually, of course, if you know, there's anything about consulting, knows it's a very stressful environment, very much full of ego and bravado and, you know, I guess, achievement and, uh, again, very commercially motivated. So I was very, in quotes, successful in that. You know, I did well and I kind of, you know, ticked all the boxes of progression, all those things, and found myself you know, seen as a success, but feeling actually like a, a bit of a failure inside because it was not meaningful, it was actually deeply bad for my, my physical health and I was really struggling with that and I just felt a bit empty actually I felt that I had you know, a job that paid well and that I seemed to be doing well and that everyone you know looked at it and felt that looks like a, a good thing to be doing and yet I didn't feel proud of what I did and I didn't feel motivated by it so I eventually broke out of that cycle actually largely due to a, a wake-up call I had around some a back pain problem which is an interesting story in itself but I, I went, went, went off and did an, an MBA and thought well, I want to do something different to use my you know, skills in a different way. And I was thinking I might move into another field of business. And uh, of course, with an MBA, you learn all about every industry. And I found this fascinating thing of, even though I could do all the different things, the finance and the strategy, um, I wasn't really motivated by any of the, in the, the opportunities. I, you know, whether it's aircraft manufacturing or toothpaste or ball bearings or you know, fast moving consumer goods, all these different industries we have, actually, I'm not motivated by selling people things they don't need. And actually, most business comes down to making with a financial case to sell people stuff. And actually that didn't turn me on. So I realized with that journey that it was a very great journey of self-discovery that what I really wanted to do was to contribute rather than to consume and to progress. And it's finding something in some way I could make the world a better place. It sounds rather too dramatic, but but what I discovered was I had a passion for climate change and sustainability at that time and st still do. The fact that we're on a path towards planetary disaster and haven't really woken up to that. So I used this change in career as a, as a springboard to move into something in that area spent five years then working on sustainability issues and this idea of you know we, we need to take care of the planet more seriously but what I discovered in that part of my journey was actually the biggest challenge we face ecologically is is this narrative that says progress is about growing the economy it's about having more and consuming more and in fact the solution to that isn't only about technology and wind turbines and changing behavior and all these things that people were looking at in sustainability. The real challenge is, is helping people realise that a truly fulfilling life isn't about the accumulation of stuff. It's about living a happy life, living a life you love, all the things that you talk so much about, Phil. So I discovered that for myself and then realised that my passion would be trying to you know, bring that message to a wider audience. And I just had this amazingly fortuitous combination of factors where I, I had come in my head to this realisation that I wanted to work in this area, again, focusing on happiness and what really makes for a good life. At the same time that some of those founders I mentioned before, Richard Layard, Anthony Selden, had themselves been thinking, we need to form a movement that, uh, that focused on this. So I just popped up at the time they were looking for a director and it was one of those you know, matches that worked well. So for the last what, four years now, I've been working on this as a full-time you know, calling more than career in a way. You know? So it's, it's a thing that motivates me very much. And you know, we've had some great successes. There's still huge challenges and we're far from... The answer but that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of my journey and it's been you know rocky at times but just feel so privileged to be now doing something that feels like proper use of what I care about and, and my skills for my cause that I feel matters. Which of course is one of the you know one of the qualities of being fulfilled isn't it I mean being happy <coughs> is feeling that what you're doing is using your strengths the best and, yeah. and, and you're making a valuable contribution and you feel that you've got some kind of mission. Yes. And it's interesting as well, this is a scene that's come up a little bit for me recently in conversations I've had with other people about, you know, this sense of <coughs> being called, having a calling and having some skills and, and kind of like when you were saying you did your MBA, nothing really interested you. Mm. You could have done it. You could have done it, but it wouldn't be really what made you, you know, get, want to get mm. up in the morning and do it. And these things, I think, are really important. But when you stumble upon something that, that captures your imagination like that, hold on to it and follow that because yes. that's... That's where the magic lies. Well, isn't you it? remind me actually of a specific exercise I did as part of that journey. Um, a chap called Neil Crofts had come up with this model, um, which is that you could, anyone could find their purpose in life if they just ask themselves three questions. And the three questions are um, what are your talents? Your real strengths, what are you good at? The second question is um, what are you passionate about? Very much like you've just said. And then the third question, interestingly, was what makes you angry? What would you like to see change? And he said if you can combine what you're good at and what you really care about to do something about an issue that makes you frustrated, you find your life's purpose. And so that's kind of made, helped me articulate this and, and make that change. That's very nice. And John Paul Flintoff, who was yes. talking the other day, was saying yes. some very similar things, wasn't he, about 
are the most important things for working out what you want out of staff change. Which brings me back to um, the action happiness. I've been to a number of the, the mm. talks and um, some quite amazing people come and talk. Yes. A couple of things that interest me about that. First of all, you know, in a in a in a world where there's a lot of jadedness and people aren't that interested, you've got an amazing uh, amount of people ready to come out and sit down on Wednesday evening and listen, mm. you know, to an interesting speaker. Yeah. What's the secret? How have you done that? What, what do you think has made that happen? I and mean, in a relatively short space of time, but, you know, you get somebody speaking and you get a packed hall. Well, that's a good question. I, I've not really thought about that before. I think one of the things we've I've done either consciously or unconsciously with Action of Happiness is sort of try to unify two things that have very much um, been around for a long time and yet both are perhaps slightly flawed views of the world. And I guess on one hand you have the self-help movement, which is very much about how do I make me better and improve mm -hmm. me in self-development. In some ways you can argue it, it's, it's represents or one of the biggest problems we have in society, which is people becoming a bit too self-obsessed and self-centred, which of course drives a lot of problems we have in our world. And then on the other hand you have maybe the, what you might think of as the altruistic movement, the Save the World movement, the Let's Campaign for Change movement, all of which is hugely important and has motivated some of the biggest changes in our society and for our history. And yet often it's motivated for a very sort of worthy and not necessarily a, a sort of language that really connects with people. And I think what we said with Action for Happiness is this is about building a happier society, which includes a happier me, because you can be nice to anyone if you're miserable yourself, but it includes a happier we as well. And actually, so, so our lens has not been a, a movement of people that want to make themselves happier. It's a movement of people that care about how do they look after their own happiness, but want to make a positive difference in the world. But it's, it's linking to that altruism, not just through a lens of we should, but also we want to, because we're motivated by it. We actually recognise that when we do good for others, we feel good too. So when all of the themes and speakers we've had have been in some way connected to this idea of you know, improving my own well-being and contributing to the well-being of others, is this sort of really magical combination that motivates you and makes the world a better place. So I've, I think that might be one reason, and so the online community we've built around those ideas is a little bit different to the sort of slightly more personal development uh, only community, and also slightly different to some of the campaigning and sort of pushes movements for social change, which are often anti-something, they're very much against, and a lot of anger and hate. We've worked really hard to try and create a narrative that's about change, but it's about a positive vision of what could happen rather than being against. I mean, I'm deeply frustrated by the cynicism in the media, by the, the priorities of politicians, by the way workplaces treat their employees, but we, we try and address those things through a lens of what could be rather than, you know, and I love this quote, what is it, um, spend less time bashing what you hate and more time promoting what you love, I think that's one of our sort of principles. Well, it seems to me that you've done an amazing job doing that, I've yeah. so seen a few few people recently talking about Action for Happiness, <coughs> and, uh, you know, thousands of people turning up, mm. Thoughts and Bardo was one of them. A mm. massive call full of people. Um, which brings me on to my next kind of question, which is who inspires you? You know, who, who for you do you think, ah, like they really inspire me? Mm. Gosh. Well, I mean, two people immediately spring to mind um, that I've sort of connected with recently. One is actually Richard Laird, who we already mentioned, who's one of the founders of Action Happiness. So here is a very much a sort of establishment figure, um, you know, a well known and credited economist working in conventional economics of the labour market theory, who had a sort of epiphany that helped made him realise that actually the standard way that economists look at the world, which is about maximising economic growth and looking at things in monetary terms, is flawed and we need this new conception of progress. So he's dedicated the last maybe 10, 15 years of his life to that. Wrote a book called Happiness, which changed my life when I read it and brought me into this, it's a big contributor to me doing this. But the reason I mention him as inspiration isn't necessarily because of that book, but it's because he... He works in that spirit I just mentioned of positive change rather than attack, but he has he doesn't let go of issues. So he's got a real passion for, for mental health and recognising that the biggest driver of unhappiness in society is people who are anxious, anxious and depressed who are not getting the support they, they can and should have. And he has worked tirelessly to get the health service to invest in this. So he is pretty much the reason that we have something now in the health service in the UK called IAPT, improving access to psychological therapies. So anyone who works as a clinical psychologist to be very aware of this. So millions and millions of pounds have gone into training up psychologists to provide additional evidence-based therapies, which we know help you know, people recover from, not just feel a bit better, but recover in many cases from um, serious anxiety and depression disorder. And, and he has just relentlessly knocked on the door of politicians, made the economic case, never given up. He's just written a fabulous new book called Thrive, all about this topic, calling for, you know, it's, it's a scandal that 
You know, whereas almost everybody with a physical illness gets treatment of some kind. Only 15% of people who are mentally ill get any support. I mean, he, he, we all hear these numbers and we get shocked by them, but he actually badges politicians until it changes. You know? So that, for me, is an example of someone really living the values of what we care about, but just relentlessly pursuing change, but in a positive and enthusiastic way. So very much an inspiration to me. You said two people? Yeah, the other one is a chap who's from the US called Nippon Mehta, who embodies one of the other real principles of, of actual happiness about this, you know, caring for the happiness of others. He, we, we talk a lot about compassion and kindness and all these things. This man really lives this stuff. So he is a kind of very successful entrepreneur and sort of, I guess, again, a guy with a commercial background in California. But he, he is just basically... He discovered, actually, I think, almost by chance, that by giving some time voluntarily to help a, a cause with some of their technology skills, that they found this huge abundance of joy and kind of fulfilment from helping for free. And so they created a whole series of services around this idea of, you know, um, s sort of service to others, you know, so giving things with no expectation of return. So they've created something, for example, called Karma Cafe, where you, you turn up and your meal has been paid for by a previous customer, and you have a meal served in a cafe, and then at the end, you have the option to donate money to contribute to one of the future customers' meals. And he, I mean, he does things like he'll go and travel around a country only without any money, just going around and meeting people and connecting with them and sort of you know, visiting their homes and showing that through kindness and connection that you can, you know, you can achieve more than you ever thought possible. Um, not in an exploitative way, but in a way that just sort of symbolises generosity. They're always doing things to give away time and services for free. So I just think that we talk about this a lot, the, the power of, you know, happiness, or caring about happiness of others, this man lives this day in, day out in a really inspiring way. There's certainly a lot of evidence, isn't there, that, that m more happiness comes from that bit, the contributing to others, the seeing the, the smile on the, on the face of somebody, that the, there's more magic in that, more reward in that than you get really anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, I certainly found that for myself. Mm -hmm. I think I, in, in turning from a life of how do I make me a success to a life of how do I contribute, it's been a big impact on my life but but there are also people and I know some um, very well who, who do so much for others and don't look after themselves so the other aspect of this is we just like everything we need a sense of balance and there are people who perhaps give their life in huge service to others perhaps partly because they're running away from their own you know demons or they're not quite at peace with themselves and actually that isn't great either yeah. so like all these things it's about giving but also recognizing that you know we have to be compassionate to ourselves too and there's this fascinating thing. So in the US, there's been this big focus for some decades now on self-esteem, you know, telling kids they can be anything they want to be and building up, you know, people's egos in the wrong word, but giving people a sense of confidence. And, um, and that's fine and good, but it can, of course, go wrong. So obviously telling people that they're infallible can often lead to a lack of resilience and then failing terribly. So what's now, I think, a much more positive way of talking about that stuff is self-compassion. It doesn't mean tell yourself you're something you're not. It's just, it's about saying... I'm okay with who I am, I'm flawed and I have problems and challenges, but I'm okay with that. And actually what we found with some of our own work is one of the biggest links to fulfillment in life is that ability to just be okay with who you are, not to try to be something you're not. It's easy to say and really, really hard to do. And we've got this poster that says something like, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides, <laughs> which I think is really powerful. And I've seen this, I mean, one of the big things for me is you know, I have young children, three kids, seven and under. And the thing I see again and again in, in parenting is that parents work really hard to create this image that everything's fine you, know, you wander around and you see families and you go, oh look at them they're perfect children they're well behaved they're doing well at school they're polite you know other people's family lives look joyous and wonderful <laughs> and of course behind closed doors every family has its nightmare moments and disasters and tantrums and you know I, I, I feel like I have an obligation now as a parent to sort of be honest in how these things are going rather than doing the Facebook thing of sharing the look at my perfect <laughs> life do the thing of saying do you know what I'm actually exhausted I'm stressed and something's gone wrong and that's part of I think this self-compassion which is not trying to paint the image that everything's perfect. It's, sort of, it's more authentic and, and real. Well, for me, the compassion thing is a massive thing in what the work that I mm. do. And one of the things uh, in the lightning process and in the Get the Life You Love program is we get people to take the position of being a coach to themselves so that they, they, they create a constant presence that's coaching. <clears throat> and the first thing the coach says to them is, basically, you're brilliant. Mm. You know, you're great. You're, you're great. You're using the new word rather than the other word. And what I find phenomenal is the number of people who cannot say it or allow themselves really? to say it or hear it. They would rather eat their own you know, head than <laughs> say, you're a, I quite like you, you're a decent person. And you're like, my God, what, you know, what is that all about? Where, where did they learn that? Because that's learned. When, as you know, with little kids, when they're born, 
they don't have any sense of hatred or not liking, mm. you know, people or something. That all comes later on. We start with a complete sense of we are connected to everything and everything is luxus, you know, and, and we were good and, and healthy and, and fit. Yeah. And then we learn something else somewhere along the line. And getting people to kind of even connect with that is extraordinary. You see, you know, I work with you know some top people, top businessmen, mm. successful in every way you can imagine. You can't say nice things to themselves. Or people, as you say, who are very caring to other people but can't do it to, to themselves. And we say, you know, <clears throat> we often say, if you treated your friends like you treat yourself, would you have any? And the answer so often is no. I mean, it's, yeah, I think you've absolutely nailed it there, Phil. But one, there's a quote that I often use or remember as a parent, try to remember, that says, the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. Mm. Which I think, is, again, it's got a lot of power in it. And, of course, many of these things come from our earliest experiences and the sort of wired into us by the environments we developed in, whether that's at home or school or, or other formative experiences. And, and actually, many of us who want the best for our kids or want the best for the people we, we look after you know, do things that actually contribute to some of these effects. I mean, I've seen this in myself. I, I have a tendency, like many parents, to praise my kids' achievement. And what that creates is the sense of conditional love, that you are valued because you have achieved this. Um, and, of course, there's lots of literature now that says we should be praising effort, not achieving. Mm -hmm. you know, you've tried really hard is rather different saying, I value you because you happen to be mm -hmm. good at this thing. And yet, you know, I probably grew up with that same sense of, you know, I, mean, I, I, I sometimes refer to myself as, as a recovering people pleaser. <laughs> and I spent a lot of my life trying to please people, and that's probably why I was quite good at some of my jobs I did. And yet, actually, that comes from a lack of that sort of self-compassion in a way, mm -hmm. that sense of I'm only worthy if I tick boxes and people say, oh, hasn't he done well? So, you know, I, you know we pass these things on to our children. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we have a responsibility in the questions we ask people and the way we treat them to not leave them with a narrative that makes them feel they're not well, I think it, what, where we are at the moment with this awareness of these things and it gives us a chance to put a full stop yes, to that yes. you know that you can see it generationally you know what the reasons your mum and dad did it to you was because of their parenting and all the rest <clears throat> but it, it's interesting although some of these like many of these ideas actually are not new there I think is a growing general awareness of them I think before they were a bit more kept in certain mm. areas of society and now it's much more interest in it so, I think to close, one of the things I often ask is, you know, if you were to have uh, 50 seconds, a minute, to say something to the world <laughs> that you thought, well, this is the most important thing I could say, of all the things I know, and you know, you know so many people you've met and hung out with, uh, and so much you've looked at, if you were to summarise the most important thing that you could say to somebody watching, what would it be? What would be your gift? What would, you, what would be your thing to look at, thing to think on? Wow. Um, well, I mean, many things come to mind, but one, one very powerful thing that had a big impact on my life and has, I think, turned me from being rather inward-focused to being much more outward-focused and much happier is, is to, to do some kind of evaluation of priorities in life. Uh, and the way, a fascinating way that someone once got me to do this was to literally list the things in life that could matter, wealth, health, family, um, purpose, you know, um, influence, lo loads of things that you might care about, both personal and professional, and put them in order. I sort of did that, and had a nice list that started with, you know, my spouse and <laughs> other things that make a difference in the list, and I felt rather good about it. Then they said, now imagine you've been a private detective following your own life for the last three months. What would they write down? How would they order that same list? And at the time, this sort of killed me because I realised that my, had they been following my life, it would have said career and earnings and whatever it was, and actually the things that I claimed to care about was completely at odds with how I was living. And so I'm fascinated by this idea of how do we help people have what I started calling a good life crisis. And what I really had was a sort of a life crisis that didn't turn out to be a, a midlife crisis or a, indeed wasn't even triggered by a, a really serious you know, physical health or, or life challenge. But it was, it was a, a crisis in realising that my priorities and how I was living were way out of sync. And I, and I just love this idea of how, how can we all turn around and say, what do I value most and how am I actually living? And I think that most of us will find that the more we connect with others, get in tune with and be comfortable with who we really are, the more we do things to help make the world a better place, then we'll find a better alignment with those things and again a more fulfilling life. So that's that's yeah. that's really that's a really interesting thing to say, actually. I've not heard that one before. People have, have this chance to say their thing. It, it, it's very interesting for me. For a number of reasons. One, in, in the lightly person to get the life you love, the first thing you have to do is you have to what we call spot the pit. And the pit is the opposite of being present. And mm. the pit is described as anything that is not life enhancing. So that okay. includes being a bit bored, 
getting annoyed in the supermarket queue, as well as you know taking drugs and, and all the other stuff. <clears throat> so really distinguishing: are you in are you in this moment, or are you somewhere else? And the other thing that made me think about is about this. this uh, what did you say? Your life crisis, happy life crisis, oh, good life crisis, good life, good life yeah. crisis. Is that very often <clears throat> a lot of the people we see in the life crisis? Their lives have fallen apart because of illness, mm. and often when you track it back, you could see it coming. There was enough factors that lo overloaded their system, so the bug got in and they couldn't recover, or whatever it was. And sometimes, quite often, and, and with other very serious illnesses, people will say, "Getting getting that illness is, on in retrospect, a long way, <laughs> long, with lot, lots mm. of perspective, was the best thing that ever happened to me because." It made me really set up and listen to things I never would have listened to. You know, I wouldn't have had half the conversations I've had. And weirdly, I'm kind of grateful for that disaster. That yeah, I've seen that a lot. And in fact, that's yeah. what really interests this good life crisis idea because there's a lot of literature about what's called post traumatic growth, where people yes. go through yeah. hideous things and actually sometimes say these rather bizarre you know, things you wouldn't expect about mm -hmm. how it's actually with hindsight been great. One way I found of creating a little bit of an insight into that way of thinking is. Is another exercise someone did with me, which is to say, imagine you are at the end of your life, and you're looking back over your life as a whole, in the highs and lows. Um, what advice might your future self give yeah. your current self now? Yeah. And again, I found that was a really good way of simulating that sense of what really matters. Yeah. And I found myself saying, spend more time with people you love, doing things you really care about. And I think again, many of us find ourselves actually, if we stop and listen to our future selves, that's probably what we, we tell ourselves. And again, with that that whole conversation. Ideally, you don't want to have to go through a breakdown to get exactly. a breakthrough. Exactly. What you want to do is have an, an early enough awareness, like through the exercise you were talking about, mm -hmm. or recognizing the pit on an ongoing basis. And if you discover that most of your life you're in the pit, and your, your thoughts aren't useful, and the environments you're not in, then it's time to wake mm -hmm. up. But you know, I think you said, you know, being you know, being with the people that you care about, that you that you love, that you want to spend time with, is a really really valuable mm -hmm. thing. And that's a real simple way of measuring. Are you doing the things that move you towards happiness or not? And so much of the time, we're just not, and we forgot it. We've got this amnesia for why we're here and what's really important because we got sucked into this other version of, yeah, do this, do that, get more of those. And we realize it doesn't really work, it doesn't really mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to hear, you know, your economist friend, who you would imagine would be, you know, fly, flying the frag of, uh, you know, well, most growth. Of our, most of our, <laughs> yes. Realizing that that is a one dimensional growth, that's not, not as true distinction of what growth could be. Mm. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating well, to have you. We could, we could talk for hours today. Maybe we'll do it again. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Brilliant.